land and a and in particular, the main Indian land claims, a point of much needed understanding and healing between members of the Wabanaki tribes and the state. The goal is to create tangible educational resources, including a traveling educational art exhibit for Maine students, the future leaders of our state. Speaking truths and elevating difficult conversations with grace and hope in the ongoing work of Wabanaki Reach. You're invited to make your offering using the donate button in the order of worship. By clicking this link, you'll be taken to GiveButter, the virtual giving site that accepts a card number, PayPal, and Venmo accounts. You may also give your offering by dropping a check in the mail or using your bank's free bill pay feature. And I think perhaps I went doing the offering of gifts before the time of quiet and prayer. So we'll have some music while you make your uh, donation, and then we'll continue with our time of quiet and prayer. How does that sound? Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Andrew. Friends, we'll now come to a time in our service that we'll set aside for silent prayer and meditation. This is a time to reflect on the events of the past week, look forward to what may come in the days ahead, or simply be here now, in this moment, and all it offers you in sensation and emotion. Today, in the midst of Indigenous Peoples Day weekend, you might also take this time to offer a prayer of healing, of apology, of empowerment to those Indigenous to this state and country who have suffered and continue to suffer great injustice. You might also use this time to offer a prayer to the earth or even set an intention for yourself and your relationship with the myriad beings of this world. Won't you join me now by relaxing into your body, taking a deep, refreshing breath, and entering in to a sacred time of quiet.
for all that can be shared, for all we hold inside, for all that we simply do not have the words to explain. We hear you, we hold you, and we wish you continued joy, immediate comfort, the seeds of peace and a way forward. To close our time of prayer and meditation, I offer a prayer by Mike Adams, who's a member of the Lilwat tribe of the Pacific Northwest and a second generation Unitarian Universalist. He prays. For the generations who survived being hunted, who endured the theft and destruction of our people's lands and who persevered through the theft and indoctrination of our children, we are grateful that you survived and for the resilience who have passed on to us. Because you did these things, we are still here. For the activists who stood against corruption and who forced a spotlight onto our people's mistreatment, we are grateful for your commitment. Because of it, we are still here. For the people who never consented to the sacrifices that were forced from you, we remember you. We mourn your suffering and loss. We honor you as best we can. We do this because we are still here. For the future generations, we ask that you remember. We look to you and keep our people's future alive after we're gone. We ask you to find strength in your ancestors and use the resilience of your people to create your future and that of your children. We ask you to ensure that when we are gone through you, we are still here. Let it be so. Let it be so, and amen. Hmm. Our reading today that I offer comes from this beautiful and powerful book called Sacred Instructions, Indigenous Wisdom for Living Spirit-Based Change by Sherry Mitchell, who's a member of the Penobscot Nation and is a lawyer, activist, trauma-informed healer, and internationally recognized activist for indigenous rights. Um, and I wanna thank Kai, Kai Fast, member of our tech crew and worship council and just beloved friend of our congregation who um, told me about Sherry Mitchell a few weeks ago. Thank you. She writes, we come into this world with a set of instructions. These instructions guide us towards our highest purpose. They lead us to the essential truths that live deep within us. This truth is encoded in our DNA. It is embedded in our genetic memory. It vibrates within us on a cellular level. Every element of life carries this vibration. Every living being has its own vibrational tone. When these tones are combined, they form the voice of creation. If we learn to listen closely, we can begin to hear that voice and allow it to guide our steps through life then we can begin to attune our daily actions with our higher purpose and become who we were meant to be. As we move through these challenging times, it is important to remember that none of us are here by accident. We entered this world with the express purpose of facilitating the changes that are manifesting during this time. And we brought with us the gifts needed to accomplish that task. Mm. Mm. Okay.
So last Sunday, our youth groups headed to Portland for an indigenous and black history walking tour led by Seth Goldstein of the Atlantic Black Box Project. The people's history of Portland, as Goldstein calls it, begins at Casco Bay Lines and winds its way through the old port, stopping at a series of historical sites that mark battlegrounds of the French and Indian Wars, stopping points of the Underground Railroad, hubs of the Atlantic slave trade, and much more. The tour concludes at the Abyssinian Meeting House on Newberry Street, the oldest standing African-American meeting house in the United States. The youth group tour last Sunday was the second time a group of first youth folks met up with Seth Goldstein this fall. Back in September, I was lucky enough to join about 20 of you for his People's History Tour. Much has stayed with me from that walk and I will likely never see the old port in the same way ever again. This week, for various reasons, one brief historical fact that Seth shared during that walk has just been haunting me. He begins the People's History Tour by recounting the impact European settlers had upon indigenous people here in what we now call Maine. He narrated the string of events the pilgrim's arrival set in motion events that devastated the Wabanaki civilization that lived and thrived here for over 10,000 years. When the Europeans arrived on this coast in the early 1600s, there were some 20,000 indigenous people living here. By 1650, a mere 40 years later, it's estimated about 5,000 remained. Mm. I don't know about you, but this knowledge causes a particular aching and incomprehensible grief to arise within me. To know that the formation of my beloved home state brought with it genocide. I believe at this point, all I can do is just face this grief, feel it, know it, and use this discomfort to inform my actions so that I will resist the urge to perpetrate and perpetuate such harm. Perhaps it is this great longing to resist and divest from the systems the Europeans set in place that has caused me to obsess over this one particular fact Goldstein shared. So one of the most important food sources for the Wabanaki people were fish that swam upstream. Salmon, alewives, herring, they're called andromas fish. When the Europeans began to claim ownership on pieces of land here, they often built settlements near bodies of water, specifically rivers where they could fish. And to fish, they used weir nets Nets that the Europeans would set across an entire river from one side to the other. In this way, they could catch all the Andromas fish as they swam upstream. And so, therefore, all those fish never made it to many of the places where the Wabanaki fished upstream. Nor were those fish able to reach the pools where they would breed and create more fish. As a result of the set European settlers fishing nets and their intention to catch as many fish as they possibly could, whole stocks of fish died off. The ecosystem was irreparably damaged and an important food source was lost for everyone. Talk about the exact opposite of mutualism. All of our creation stories teach us that we are born out of the same foundational elements that make up all life in the known universe. Sherry Mitchell writes, I'll say it again. All 
of our creation stories teach us that we are born out of the same foundational elements that make up all life in the known universe. In her essay entitled Indigenous Prophecy and Mother Earth, which is also from this book, All We Can Save, Mitchell, a lawyer, teacher, and healer from the Penobscot Nation, recounts the creation story of humanity from her sacred tradition. The first human, she writes, was formed from the soil of Mother Earth. And the eyes were the first part of the body to be created. Once the eyes were created, the first human remained in the soil for an entire cycle of life, watching how the rest of creation moved before their arms and legs were given to them. When I read this sacred creation story, I immediately thought of the creation story in Genesis, the story I was taught, the story many of you were taught, and the story the European settlers were definitely taught about how humans were created. You might even know some of it by heart. That story reads, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. A little different and just being given eyes and waiting for an entire life cycle to rise up with arms and legs. The ethos evoked by the Genesis creation story, an ethos defined by dominion, division, entitlement, and separation, has laid the foundation for the society in which we live today a society defined by a climate crisis, a wealth gap, a racial caste system, a me and mine first mentality, the abuse and slaughter of millions of animals and self-entitlement celebrated as rugged individualism. In short, this ethos, as Sherry Mitchell puts it, has caused human beings to fall out of alignment with life. We've created a world, she says, that none of us, would have chosen to live in. In her powerful book, Sacred Instructions, Indigenous Wisdom for Living Spirit-Based Change, go get it from your local independent bookstore. She provides antidotes and alternatives to the way of human life proposed in Genesis. As the image of the European settlers setting their nets across the entire river to catch all the fish arose and lingered with me this week, I found myself drawn to one of Sherry Mitchell's teachings in particular on rights and responsibilities. In the US, we love our rights rights to do all kinds of things, rights that many of us cannot agree upon rights that many of us claim as our individual rights, rights that are self-evident, rights that we fight, die, and kill for, rights that some of us are more deserving of than others. In a chapter entitled Rights and Responsibilities, Embracing the Balance, Mitchell offers a restorative alternative to our American notion of rights. 
My tribal stories have taught me that our inherent rights are derived from, our first, from the first agreement we made with the creator when we first emerged in this world. Under this agreement, she writes, we have the right to live unencumbered on this land with full access to the sources of our survival, such as food, water, and shelter, as long as we uphold our responsibility to live in balanced harmony with the rest of creation. She concludes, we understand that these rights are not self-evident or self-generating. They are strengthened or weakened by the degree of responsibility that we take to uphold our agreement. Makes so much more sense, right? We have a right to live a good life. The right to have access to the resources we need to survive. In order to live a good life, we have to take care of the world and the other beings with whom we share this life because that's where our shared resources for survival come from. Therefore, our right to a good life is inherently tied to our responsibility to live in caring balance with all of creation, rights and responsibility. Reading this chapter a few times this week, thinking about those settler fishing nets, I kept asking myself, why do I want so much? Why do we want so much? Why do we need it all as fast as possible? Prime overnight free shipping. Why are we afraid of letting go, of having less, of sharing? Why is it impossible for us to feel like we have enough? It has been like this since the settlers arrived. This is, a, excuse me, this is a white colonist mindset. Why? I'm sure way back when, when we were, we were catching way more fish than we needed with those nets. Why did we think we needed them all? And why did we keep catching them? An exclusive and empty insistence on rights creates a vacuum that can never be filled, Sherry Mitchell writes. Demanding rights without taking responsibility for creating and maintaining those rights for others creates a warped sense of entitlement that leads to violence and injustice. We must be willing to do more than make demands. We must be willing to actively work to create a world where all demands can be met. Friends, the great irony of our fear of not having enough is that it tends to inspire self-serving and individualist tendencies amongst us. If there is anything we've learned over the past year and a half, it's that when we are alone and isolated, it doesn't feel so good after a while. Something is wrong. And we really don't have enough. It's because we don't have each other. Because we don't feel a part of a larger whole. In order to survive, we must all come to realize that we do not exist solely for the benefit and development of our individual selves as human beings, Mitchell teaches. Rather, our role of human beings is to evolve into a state of interbeing with the rest of life so that we move ever toward universal harmony and balance. This is the only way life will remain viable into the future. On this Indigenous Peoples Day weekend, come out, my friends, come out, come out. Come out to see yourself. 
to see the large whole, W-H-O-L-E, that you are an important part of. The larger whole that welcomes you, the whole to which you have a right to belong. The larger whole, this interbeing that offers you a great purpose for your life. The purpose of taking responsibility to care for and maintain and seek always harmony and balance. None of us are here by accident, Sherry Mitchell reminds us. None of us are here by accident. We entered this world with the express purpose of facilitating the changes that are manifesting during this time. And we brought with us the gifts needed to accomplish that task. So let's get to work, my friends. Let's pull up our nets and make way for, for all, all we drive. Let, let it be slow, slow. and let, let it start there. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is 1,054 and can be found in the order of the Oh. Uh -huh. 
nice to watch so many of you sing just now. Mm. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Gwen and Mac. And thank you, Pete, for running the camera today. Gwen for doing double duty, also doing tech. Uh, a reminder that we will have a Zoom coffee hour beginning right after the service. Just hang on here in Zoom if you'd like to chat with folks. And we'll also have a BYO in-person coffee hour at the picnic tables outside church, probably starting around 1140, 1145-ish. I also want to draw your attention to a handful of events um, that we'll be holding at church in the next few months, celebrating Wabanaki rights. Uh, we will have an interactive mapping experience on November 5th, as well as, um, lost the page, Phil, you lost the page. If you check channels on Friday, you will see all kinds of links of all kinds of happenings to support Wabanaki rights and sovereignty. Faith in Action will be focusing specifically on Wabanaki rights and indigenous rights throughout the next month. All right, my friends, it was good to be with you on Zoom. <laughs> Hopefully we can be back in person and on Zoom again soon. As we come to the end of our service, won't you join me in a time of prayer? May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May we all experience profound joy and the causes of profound joy. May we all have access to the resources that allow us to thrive. May we have the wherewithal to share these resources with all the beings with whom we share this beautiful planet so that we all can thrive and be free. And once you join me in our unison benediction, Gwen put it in our chat if you'd like to read along and it is also in the order of worship you received this morning. For those who come here seeking God, may God go with you. For those who come embracing life, may life return your affection. For those who come to seek a path, may a way be found and the courage to take it step by step. Go in peace, my friends. Be good to yourselves and others, and we'll see you soon. Bye now.